And again, my name is Jeff Gumis, and the focus of today's webinar is on delivering evidence-based instruction with technology. Um, since the start of school closures, which is a little over a month ago now, uh, we've been doing a lot of trainings specifically focused on skill blocks, which is a new tool that we happened to release at the start of March that allows teachers to search for resources in math, just math at the moment, align to standards and then deliver those to students. So our focus for the past month has been on diving deeper into how to integrate math resources into instruction, both for the moment right now where we are all sort of in a forced virtual instruction world and in the future. And so what I really wanna preface everything that we talk about today is that as we are looking at these resources and thinking about how can I use them, Please think of them not just for how can I use these right now where this is the only mode of instruction, this virtual mode of instruction that we're in, but how can I also be using these resources when I get back into the classroom? Because the tools that we'll be looking at today are fantastic uh, for increasing access and engagement with learners right now, but they also can certainly be used when we get back to class and provide for richer experiences for your learners. So the way that this session is going to be walked through, uh, we're going to do a quick overview of evidence-based reading instruction, as well as just some sort of tips and things to think about as you are uh, considering how these resources might be used uh, within your virtual setting right now. So things like bandwidth and access and how you'll communicate. Um, and where do each of the resources fall in, say, a blended learning sequence, where some of the work is with students working on their own, and some of the work is sort of teacher facilitated right now, you know, that being virtual. Uh, then we will look at a number of resources that support each of the four components of evidence-based reading instruction. Then we'll look at how to take those and sort of put them together so that we can create and design online um, reading experiences and lessons that integrate all of the components of evidence-based reading instruction. If we have time at the end, I do have a quizzes that we will play together, but uh, I do wanna leave time for questions and follow-ups before that. So in terms of the tools that we'll be using today, this has also been something that I feel is important as we're doing these trainings and talking about things to use in distance learning. Uh, these are the four main tools that we will be using today. Uh, for teaching, obviously, Zoom, that is the tool that we're using right now for me to present in a real-time, face-to-face, albeit virtual manner. The Padlet is a tool that can be used. It's very flexible for a number of different things but we will be using it today as a collaborative tool for you to be entering in your ideas, both coming into this session in terms of things that you do revolving around the components of evidence-based reading instruction, as well as, as we're looking at resources, your ideas or thoughts on how you might use those with your learners. And I encourage to think about if, if you had registered for this webinar as of like eight o'clock yesterday or maybe even earlier, I sent out an email with links. One of them was to this Padlet. And the reason I bring that up is when we're thinking about how right now we have very limited time that is actually face to face or in real time with our learners. We need to think about ways that we can maximize that time so that we are really teaching um, and not just sort of walking through procedural things. As I said, I've been doing math for the most part up to this point. Um, and so I think it's, it's probably wasted time uh, if the one hour or two hours or how many you're actually doing synchronous learn learning with your learners, you're just walking through a PDF. Um, so it's thinking about how do we sequence our instruction where maybe there's things that students are getting ahead of time that you're asking them to work on, to read, to do something before you get to this moment where you're working in Zoom. And then you can have an active discussion around the work that they did ahead of time. And Padlet is a great tool because it allows students to all sort of add their own information to this board that everyone can see. And then that becomes a great sort of springboard for you to launch discussions on whatever the topic of your lesson is. Um, you know, during the day. 
Uh, Google Classroom, many of you are familiar with. This is the tool that I'll just share with you and show how you can sort of manage and assign some of these things. And then um, Wakelet is a tool that allows us to sort of curate and organize resources from different places all in one spot and then share that with students. So I wanna take a quick poll before we dive in and I'm gonna launch that poll now. And this is in Zoom and this is actually a tip that I wanna share with you. If you are using Zoom, uh, you have the ability to set up polls ahead of time that you can use as a formative you know, assessment uh, tool um, at, for various checkpoints throughout the lesson. I believe you have to have them set up ahead of time, but if you know what you're gonna be talking about during the course of a, a uh, real-time lesson, uh, this polling tool is very uh, powerful. So uh, there is a poll that is up on your screen right now. Please select all that apply um, in terms of the resources that you currently are using or have used in the past with your learners. And the Zoom number is just amazing to me. We're at about 80 plus percent. Um, I don't think many of us were using Zoom um, prior to today or prior to this past month. And now it's become sort of the primary driver of face-to-face -face instruction. A lot of you are using Google Classroom, I see. And thank you for all of you who have voted. It's almost uh, two thirds of you. So these are the results of the poll. Uh, only one of you uh, either is using or has used Wakelet, so I'm excited to share that with you today, and a few of you are using Padlet. Two things to think about with Zoom and Google Classroom. Again, right now, you're using those maybe because they, they have to be used to provide, with Zoom, obviously, face-to-face -face instruction, with Google Classroom, sort of a hub for all of your content. Think about, are there things that you're finding beneficial with these? that when you get back to quote unquote normal, that these are tools that you want to continue to, to leverage in some way. And an example I like giving from a meeting I had last week with a group of teachers I work with in Illinois is we have a community college, she's an adult ed instructor at a community college here in Illinois and she's an ESL instructor. And she has always, like since she started teaching, had open office hours for students to access and very rarely has she found that students are actually utilizing that time. Now she's running open office hours using Zoom where she has trained her students to you know, know how to go to a Google Sheet where she sets all of the times that she has available and they can go and enter in the time slot or slots that they want and they have her link for her Zoom room. So they know to go at the time that they set. She says that most of her students are now utilizing that. And obviously there might be additional supports that students need right now because of our current setting, but think about the other factors that might have prevented her learners from accessing her during open office hours when it was in person at the school. You know, we talk about the, the common barriers of transportation and time and family commitments and jobs that don't allow students to necessarily stick around and spend time um, you know, at campus, in her case, uh, to talk about things with instructors. And you know, now she's using Zoom, and that is a tool that she can use when things get back to normal, because it's opening up uh, for more students the opportunity to actually um, utilize that. So please you know, be thinking about that. Sorry, I forgot to share the results, but this is the results that we had from the poll um, that we just did. And then the same thing with Google Classroom. I have another teacher that is, has always said she's, she's very disorganized and she feels like she's so much more organized now that she's using Google Classroom because not only does she have to organize it for herself and her activities, but she has to organize those activities for her students. Um, so be thinking about those things. So Wakelet is one of the tools, it was the least used tool from that poll that we're going to be using. And I'm gonna paste the Wakelet link into the chat right now. So all you need to do is highlight um, that link and copy it, and then open up a new browser tab as I'm doing right now, and then just paste it in here. And this is going to open up the Wakelet. Um, Wakelet is a tool that allows us to curate resources from various places and put them into one place. And it's a, it, just like Padlet, it is a very flexible tool. 
I have a wakelet that is just winter recipes, right? So I created, you know, a new wakelet and I went in and as I found recipes over the course of winter that I liked, all you do is copy a URL and then paste it in and then you, you know, have all of these things listed out in, in however you want. There's different views that you can have for your wakelet. Um, I'm doing a list view, but what we have in this wakelet for you to access right now and afterwards is all of the session resources. So this link is to the slide deck. So if you were to click on that right now, it's gonna open you up into the slide deck that we're using. I don't know if I see anybody in there right now, um, but all you have to do is click on this and it's gonna open a new tab and there's the slide presentation. Uh, this is a link to the Padlet. So the Padlet that I want us to be using today as we uh, share our ideas, just click on this and then that can launch that. Um, this is a PD resource that, has, uh, that was done in the past uh, using all of the tools that we um, are gonna be talking about today that's available to use at any time. But then as we go through and you, you scroll on down, you're gonna see here are resources for fluency, for vocabulary, uh, for comprehension, and all of these are the resources that we're actually going to be walking through today. So what's nice about this wakelet is, you know, I'm gonna be kind of inundating you with a lot of different tools over the course of the next um, 75 minutes now. But with this wakelet, you always have access to, you know, those tools. So think about, this could be something that, these are all the websites that you want students to be using for maybe, um, self-guided instruction, or maybe they are just the websites that they're gonna use, like um, some of your publisher online tools that they might be accessing. You can just provide links for them in one place and then share this Wakelet. Um, the other thing that I've been showing teachers how to do with Wakelet is not just as sort of this curation tool, but also actually building lessons out. And so I'll just show one that I, I built last week as we were presenting on blended learning in math unequivalent fractions. And so what I was showing uh, the instructors during this session is that you can type in your own sort of things here, this intro, and then I've been breaking up my wakelets into explore, learn, and practice, um, where here are things that allow you to explore the concept of equivalent fractions. Here are lessons, videos, and things that allow you to learn. Here are games that you can use that will help sort of reinforce the concept in game type formats. And then here are practice sets. And so it, what it ends up being is this sort of standalone playlist or lesson uh, sort of, of content that has multiple options for learners um, around this concept of equivalent fractions all in one place. You could put a set of readings uh, in here that, that are all around the same topic, for example, that students could access at any time around a topic that you want. I didn't mean to. Uh, you should be able to go to another tab. Someone just said, no, we can't go to another tab because then we are leaving the meeting. Uh, no, because Zoom should be open, would be open in one tab or in your Zoom browser. Um, you, you need to sort of toggle from Zoom to your browser and, and then you should be able to, to do that. The problem with Zoom that I've always found is I can't actually show you my Zoom controls, um, which I think would be helpful in some cases. Uh, so if anything, if, uh, and again, you can just sit and watch, that's fine, but I would really like it if folks could have the Wakelet open um, uh, and, and within that Wakelet, again, you can access the presentation slides but the group Padlet is really the most important piece because I just wanna sort of use that as a way of modeling uh, sort of you know, how you could use a tool like this in virtual distance learning settings. So um, the Padlet, what I'm gonna ask you to do is go to that Padlet and in each column, add a tile and describe how you currently incorporate that component. So I'm gonna open up the Padlet um, and I'll actually paste this Padlet link into the um, chat as well. Thank you for the tip, Carrie, um, on exiting full screen under Zoom. So uh, this is the Padlet link. It's bit.ly forward slash E-B-R-I pad. And it's going to bring you to this. Now Padlet is a tool that you can use both uh, again in a virtual world and face-to-face. -face. It's very mobile friendly. 
as well. And a number, I've used it in a lot of sessions in real time, face to face, where you know I'll put that bit.ly up and then folks, I have them get out their phones. And then it's a tool that they can be communicating and adding things in Padlet as they're going. So I'm going to uh, you know, just show you how this works. So all you have to do, these are the four components of evidence-based reading instruction. I'm going to say that um, reading skills for today's adults. And I can say something like, I um, tell learners the levels they should go to. And that's it. I just click on that and then it goes in here. So great. Thank you for folks. So people are adding in. So what are things that you are currently using for each of these components of evidence-based reading instruction? And if you are not familiar with sort of these components and how they're structured, we're about to dive into that. So um, thank you for adding. Uh, please, again, go to the Padlet and add your ideas as we are sharing. I'm also realizing my video is still up, so I'm going to get rid of that um, because I want you to be able to sort of focus on the content. Uh, Google Classroom is obviously just walking through these tools we just talked about. Great as a hub for managing assignments and activities. A lot of you, it seems, are familiar with this now. Just so you know, um, in using something like Padlet and in using something like Wakelet, uh, I'm actually going to put up the Wakelet again. I didn't mean to remove it. When you're using tools such as these, both of these integrate seamlessly into Google Classroom. So remember I shared this out again, if, if you didn't get the email, that's okay. I shared this out last night, but if I click on share here, um, I have the ability to share this Padlet on Google Classroom and it's gonna open up a window like this and the same exact thing would happen with that Wakelet. And so I can go and select the class that I want to assign it to. I can select what I want to actually you know, do with it. So I could say create an assignment and then I click go and then I'm going to call this EBRI activity. This could be, you could have a Padlet for them to talk about a reading, uh, right? What did you think of the, what was the topic of the reading? What were the main details? Do you agree or disagree with the writer? Those could all be columns in your Padlet. Um, do this, but I'm just going to be very truncated here, do this before class. So obviously I'd put more directions in here, but these tools, more and more tools seamlessly integrate with Google Classroom so that you build something like I've built here, click on assign with Google Classroom, and then it's just going to directly assign into Google Classroom. And now that's been posted to my class. So really great tools that you can use in this case for collaboration and sharing. All right. So <clears throat> You're probably well uh, on your way at this point in terms of considering things like communication and assigning content and sharing content with students. But um, obviously at this point in time, you have established some mode of communication with your learners in terms of check-ins, in terms of assigning things. And it's probably more than one of these three, if not all three of these um, modes, just because of the various levels of access of students. But when you're thinking about your communication, particularly around assignments, um, be thinking about your goals and the tools that your students are already using. There's a reason why tools like WhatsApp and Remind have been popular because they model texting and students tend to be sort of more apt to uh, look at and respond to texts than they do to email. But then also think about how much of your instruction needs to be synchronous, which means face-to-face, -face, virtual, or all real-time, versus um, asynchronous, which means that students can be working on things at any time. So things like assigning readings, you know, those obviously don't have to happen right now while we're all together. Think about should those be things that I assign ahead of time and then give them sort of a structure so that they're doing that before our face-to-face -face time. And then when we're also considering things like Zoom, also we need to consider uh, bandwidth. Um, and so which tools are going to be lower in bandwidth 
which is why Google Classroom is really great because things like opening up a doc in Google Classroom does not require a lot of bandwidth, whereas watching a video um, or joining a Zoom does require more bandwidth. And those are just sort of access considerations that you need to think about. Um, what I've been focusing on instructor with with excuse me with instructors are sort of sort of three things really. What what are the tools and the strategies that you're going to use for communication ongoing? What are the resources that you're going to use specifically for content? So what are those learning resources that you want to share with students and have them using more regularly? And then how are you actually managing that? How are you assigning? How are you monitoring? How are you reminding students? Um, of assignments that they should be doing. And again, thinking about that in terms of this is something that we have to do right now because we are virtual, but when you get back into the classroom, um, this is blended learning, right? If you're assigning a reading to do beforehand, that's individual work. And then when you get to Zoom time, that's your teacher facilitated where you're the teacher, you're modeling reading strategies for students, like that's your role. So maximize that face-to-face -face time in terms of modeling how to be a, a, a good reader, right? Um, and then be offering things like uh, leveled readers that, and there's a couple sites that we'll look at that allow you to just sort of level out. These are all sort of readings that are at level for a particular learner so that they can be practicing reading on their own. And then tools like Padlet allow for students to be collaborative. Um, again, in a virtual manner now, but also even when we're in a face-to-face -face environment. I see a thing in the chat. I just want to make sure that I'm not missing any questions. This will be recorded. I, I know there's a lot being covered in this session. Um, and then I do have a QA. and a uh, Please, if you can, uh, may, put your questions in the chat. I'll, I'll stop in a moment to look at Q&A when we get to a breaking point. Um, but I can't share my screen in a slide and look at Q&A in the same time. It's a weird Zoom limitation. Another, so to facilitate what I just talked about, on the Crowded Learning website, and this is in the Wakelet, we've listed out tools that are organized in those different areas. So things for communication, content resources, and then tools for sharing, tools for assessing, um, tools for organizing your resources for learners. And then we also provide a guide with questions for you to actually sort of work through and think about um, what are the communication tools? What is my purpose? What are the logistics that go along with that? And so which tools might lend themselves best for um, each of those areas of virtual instruction? So I, I will exit out now just so I can see what the Q&A to do. So the questions I have. So can you set up a question with multiple choice answers just like you did? Um, in Zoom, Sue, I'm guessing since the timestamp on that is 11.08, yes, in Zoom you can set up questions with multiple choice answers um, that would be um, either multiple select or you can do uh, only one uh, selection. It's, it's nice for just sort of doing a, an on-the-fly check with learners. The problem is there is no recording that you're gonna get on, on the student responses. So if you're thinking of using Zoom polling as like a quiz tool to actually you know, really drill in and see if a learner has or hasn't gotten what you've talked about, uh, it's not a good tool for that. But it is good for sort of on-the-fly just checking at, in mass like you know how our students uh, understanding things right now, or just for, you know, engagement period, like having them, um, you know, just do a poll of something, you know, silly that they, they can do up front as a mood check at the start of a, a lesson. So it's, it's flexible in terms of how you can use it, but you're not going to get any sort of reporting. Um, and you have to create new questions uh, each time. So that's just another thing um, to, to think about. You, like when I did this webinar on Tuesday, I had to enter in the question. And then for this Thursday one, I had to enter in, in as well. So they, they don't like copy over. So that's a limitation. Um, in Google Classroom, not in the education suite, can you move a post from the streaming tab to the assignment time? That's a really good question. I'm not gonna dive into Google Classroom right now. Um, I don't think that you can. Um, that's a really good question. I think you might be able to do the reverse where an assignment shows up in the stream, 
but I don't think um, a, you can launch something or create something in the stream and then add it to Classroom. But that's something I will write down and uh, see if I can figure out an answer for you. Sorry, I'm just gonna write that, okay. <clears throat> All right, so now we're gonna dive into evidence-based reading instruction. And just some vocabulary front-loading. When I say EBRI, obviously that is evidence-based reading instruction. Um, when I say OER, Open Education Resources, just as a very sort of quick overview, an open education resource is a free resource that has a specific type of license that tells you this is what you're allowed to do with this free tool. You can embed it in your website. You can copy content from a portion of this lesson and use it in a different lesson so long as you credit the original source and say you're not using it for commercial purposes. Um, so I have a liter I've done a 90 minute session just on the difference between free and open education resources. But I, I just bring this up up front because as we're looking at a number of these resources, um, there are copyrights, even though they're free, that you need to be considerate of. There's one resource, and I'll point it out to you, that is openly licensed. And because of that, you'll see Crowded Learning has actually done some things where we've taken content from that resource and put it in different sorts of formats um, to create different types of activities for students using the content from that one source. And the reason that we can do that and know that we're able to do that is because they have Creative Commons licensing. So it's, it's, this is what the symbol kind of looks like. Um, there's other tools that are great and they have terms of use that you need to sort of be mindful of. So something like um, common Lit, you can download PDFs of the readings and actually all of the comprehension tools that we're looking at. And that's great. But you, you know, you need to be careful about then how you're, how you're using it. Obviously, that's intended for you to make photocopies so that you can share with your students. That's fine. You know, but you, you couldn't, you know, create a teachers pay teachers lesson <laughs> and you know include that PDF within the lesson that you've created on you know main idea and details right so you need to just understand that there is a difference between free and open um, and any website will have terms of use that tell you what you can or can't be doing um, I'm just gonna sort of point out that the the things that we're gonna walk through right now are part of a online professional development resource that is available to you and it is listed in the session resources at the start of the wakelet. Um, we did a professional development event uh, through Lynx, which is a community of practice for adult educators that walked through um, all of these topics two weeks at a time. Uh, and it sort of is the basis of this presentation that we are looking at today where week one, we explored each of the resources in depth, and then in week two, we developed strategies and talked about what are the strategies that you would use to integrate these resources into your instruction. So this was in a pre-COVID world. Um, but we've openly licensed all of that work, so there is a packet, and again, that's what's linked in the um, wakelet, that does walkthroughs of comprehension, of fluency, of vocabulary, um, where it talks about sort of, sort of what, are, what are the actual elements of this, why is this an important component of evidence-based reading instruction. Here are some tools that you can use. There's videos that go along with each of those, and then there are explorations of different resources that we did within this um, professional development event. But it's all been sort of organized in one place so that you have access to it at any time. The one cool thing about it that I will just point out, I'll launch it just so you can see it. It's the third thing listed in your Wakelet. Um, is because we did this in links, it goes into a discussion thread within the reading and writing community on links. And what that means is that as we were doing it in real time in October, September, October, teachers were actually answering the questions in each of these topics in links, which is great. Uh, but that was sort of done at that point. But because it's in links, let's go to reading comprehension. 
um, I can go directly to the resource exploration here. But at the start, we have all of the resources that were talked about and then the discussion threads that happened on links. So you can go in and see what teachers are saying about these different tools in links. So here you see that there have been 930 views of this topic thread and 11 comments. So some teachers have been in there commenting on the tools and which ones they're using and how they're using it. These aren't dead discussions, which means that if you look at these resources and go, hey, I want to ask teachers, how are you using this with your learners? You have the ability to do so. And because Lynx is an active community of practice, other teachers will see that uh, as someone who's a member of Lynx, which is free, um, you always get reminders each day of which discussions have um, been contributed to. So, it's a way to have active discussions around these different resources with your learners, which could be nice. Um, the ones that we're specifically going to focus on today, all of these again are in your wakelet, but um, we looked at three tools in particular for comprehension, um, a great fluency tool called Reading Skills for Today's Adults, and then a vocabulary tool um, from Appalachian State University. All of those are things that we will look at, but you'll see there's a couple others in here that were part of that professional development. Um, and just as a note, if you're familiar with crowded learning, we have skill directories of free resources in a number of content areas. So we do have a reading skill directory, but we have social studies and science and information literacy and health literacy and financial literacy resources as well. These are all free. So I encourage you to check those out because that, those are places that are great sources of reading in different content areas just beyond sort of tools that are um, reading oriented. So now just a quick overview of EBRI. Um, most of you are probably familiar with evidence-based reading instruction. It is a research-based model and if you're familiar with WIOA and the components of WIOA that you need to sort of meet in order to be an eligible training provider, having research-based literacy instruction is part of it. And so that's why evidence-based reading instruction is so important. It's the foundation of the STAR model, which is an OCTE sort of sponsored um, mode for reading instruction. So it's really um, pins on the notion of direct and explicit instruction with reading. So explanation and modeling, that's, those are things provided by you. So again, thinking about sort of the blended learning sequence, those are things that you should be doing you know, during Zoom time or doing your, during your classroom time when you're together. And then also offering guided practice and application. So again, in that blended learning sequence, those are things that are happening for learners sort of on their own or maybe in sort of collaborative environments. But the, just so you understand what these four components are and how they fit together, um, at the top, these two components of alphabetics and fluency, these are looking specifically at the recognition of what you are reading. So when we're looking at alphabetics, that's focusing on recognition of words. So this is being able to sound out words and to decode words and knowing what letter and vowel combinations mean. Alphabetics is also referred to often as phonics. Fluency is also looking at the recognition of words, but doing so within an entire text. So this is actually the notion of being able to read um, a string of words together. So it's decoding, but sort of in rapid succession of a set of words um, within a text. When we get to the bottom half of these four components, these two, vocabulary and comprehension, are meaning-based. So again, word by word, vocabulary is the uh, understanding of the specific words within a text. Whereas comprehension, which is the main goal of reading instruction, right, is comprehending all of the words within a text and being able to make sense and make connections to yourself or to the world of the text that you've read. And so that's, that's how these four components sort of fit together. Just diving a little bit deeper, alphabetics is, and I will say up front of the resources that we look at, you're gonna see the fewest in alphabetics because this is something that is obviously heavily focused on early reading within the standards. There's only two levels that actually have alphabetics based standards in them. And so a lot of the things around alphabetics are kind of uh, childish. I'll, I'll say that just because it is sort of um, what it is. 
But uh, there are some tools that we'll look at that are appropriate for adults that do focus on phonemic awareness and word analysis and then word analysis strategies. Fluency is not just about how fast you can read or if you can read a bunch of text without tripping up on the words. Fluency is also looking at can a student actually read the words with intonation? Do they know how to chunk text? Um, because based on how a learner is saying words and based on how a learner is chunking the text that they're reading, that is reflective of their understanding of the words that they are reading. So it isn't just a speed reading thing, although being able to read efficiently uh, is obviously an important skill. Vocabulary in terms of the tools that we're looking at and the standards that we're talking about around vocabulary is focused primarily on tier two words, which are often referred to as academic vocabulary. Um, and so the, the goal of reading instruction is to make sure that we are that we are actually focusing specifically on these words whose meanings might not necessarily be obvious to learners, but which do appear often in informational text, which is the focus of the standards um, and the, the tests that we you know, administer students related to adult education and reading. Um, a majority of those texts are informational texts. And then comprehension, again, this is really the ultimate goal, and this is looking at understanding and constructing personal meaning around text, being able to self-monitor and sort of think about what it is I'm reading, why did the author say it this way, how does this connect to other things that I've either read within this text or in other texts, so that you're making meaning out of the things that you are reading. So now we're gonna dive into the resources, and again, as we discuss and as I show you these resources, many of you have hopped into the Padlet and you have shared tools that you are using. So thanks, mega words. I can't wait to read these through afterwards. Um, so as we're reading and talking about these different things, you know, if you can go ahead and add uh, tiles if you see something that you really like or you think you might wanna use and share how it is you might, um, use that with your learners. Awesome, all right, so I am going to jump in. I'm actually gonna leave pretty much the slide deck now and just kind of walk through them together because we'll be jumping out into different resources. So within the CCRS, um, alphabetics are the foundational skill levels of A and B. If you're a TAPE state, these are levels L and E. So those are the only levels that really look at phonics and alphabetics. And as I said earlier, there's limited resources specifically um, for adults. Actually, another thing that as I mentioned it um, in that Padlet, if there's a resource that I show and you are currently using it, please go into the Padlet and let people know how, how you use that resource with your students. So IXL is a tool that I've heard about from a number of adult educators. Um, it is free to a point, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, you can do one activity a day for free um, within IXL, but it does have content within a number of different areas, which is nice. And as you can see uh, in terms of phonics, um, there's a ton of different activities in here. And basically, what, one of the things I really like about this is it sort of gives you this preview of the various um, activities that are within. So I'm gonna just go to this one, uh, just to sort of see and show you what it looks like. So um, I'm launching Choose the Correct Diagraph. It's got full audio. Listen to the word. Which sound does it start with? So in this, actually, I don't even know what this is gonna be. So. Shine. So it's shine, they can play it as many shine. times, and then they could hear each of these um, sounds as well, but I'm gonna select that. And so this is a series of activities or questions um, related to a particular uh, alphabetics um, concept, right? So that's IXL. And again, as I've said, I've heard a number of educators say that they use IXL. Uh, a kind of favorite of mine, just because it's pretty comprehensive, and I've seen it used very uh, widely here in Chicago with ESL populations, is learning chocolate. So this is a language learning platform. It's a vocabulary platform um, for people who are learning English. And so they do have this category of alphabetics with a lot of different things in it, but they also have lots of vocabulary um, sets like these. 
in a number of different areas. And the thing I like about learning chocolate is it has a very consistent format um, for the various um, activities that they have. Now, if you'll notice on my screen, there's lots of ads that pop up. And hey, look at the internet monitoring me because look what pops up in my ads, but I excel on the left and the right. Um, so that can be annoying. Uh, in terms of these pop-up ads, which is, is a problem. However, I've seen this in different centers across uh, Chicago where students go to the particular um, concept that they're gonna work on for the day, and then all you have to do is click on this, which will expand the window, and it cuts out all the ads, which is really nice. But I just wanna walk through the format of this because I really think it's an effective tool, so. Qu quilt. Killed. So the first screen that they see allows them to see images and the words and the sounds that go with all of those words. So they, they can see um, everything. And then there's a set of five activities in the same order, in the same sequence for every single word set in there. So this one is matching Keen. the sound to the word. Keen. Kilt. Where's kilt? There it is. Kilt. <clears throat> And then they can check their answers and see which ones they get right or wrong. Then the second matchup is no sound, so it's reading the word and matching it to the um, image. And so in this case, I'm not going to hear sounds, or quote, sorry, um, but I'm just going to be reading the word. So we're looking at um, receptive. So we've two activities that have dealt with receptive language, right? Listening um, and reading. Um, then the third matchup. Kick is just listening. Kick. Qu That's that. Qu and again, all of these I can check my answers. And then the last two deal with actually writing. And so in this case, this would be one that you really need to know all of the words um, because there's not a word bank that's provided in this case. Um, but then the last one is dictation. So it's listening. Kilt. And then writing. Um, Quilt. And so those are the, that sequence that we just walked through is the same for every single set of activities within learning chocolate. And again, all sorts of different categories. Um, and yeah, if I go to like body health, like these are all of the word sets that go, that are in this section on body health. So it's a really comprehensive tool and I just like the consistent format. So. Um, the, the set of activities that I linked to in, in um, here are specifically to the ones that deal with alphabetics, but it's a great tool for vocabulary as well. So now we're going to look at fluency, excuse me, um, and think about the, uh, the, the ways in which this tool could help learners develop fluency. And when we're talking about fluency, and a reminder, that is the ability to read a string of text fluently with prosody, with intonation, with proper chunking of text. Um, a key component of being able to do that for a learner is if you've uh, used a text that is appropriate for that learner. And so the standards define what that means um, for adult educators. And a lot of the resources that I'm gonna share, that I'm sharing right now, focus on this Lexile framework in terms of this is the readability range for each of these levels. And if you're not familiar with the college and career readiness levels, they are A, B, C, D, E. B uh, equates to tape level E. C equates to tape level M. D is level D, happens to be the same. And then this level E is adult secondary um, or tape level A. Um, and so it's really important that we're putting students into readings that are appropriate uh, for their particular level. So the tool that I think is fantastic for fluency is reading skills for today's adults. And this is one that I know many folks are familiar with, but they just did a great site update that provides a lot more rich instruction around each of the readings, and I'll show you that in a second. You might not be aware that they also have um, reading skills for today's healthcare workers. And this is similar in the structure of reading skills for today's adults, but all of the context of all of the readings at each of these different levels revolve around healthcare context. So it's kind of nice and kind of timely 
uh, specifically for the setting that we're in. And when I say they, I forgot to mention, these were both developed by um, an adult ed center in Southwest Minnesota. Um, so Marshall Adult Education from Southwest ABE developed both of these tools. And uh, I, I've heard from many instructors over the course of the past two years um, that they're familiar with it. And so I just wanna caution folks with that. If you type into Google reading skills for today's adults, you're going to be led to their old site, which is perfectly fine, but it lacks a lot of the great tools that are now in the new site. Um, they haven't taken that down yet, I'm not sure why. The new URL for the updated site is readingskillsfortoday.com, and that is what I have uh, linked in the um, wakelet that you have. So I'm gonna launch Reading Skills for Today's Adults, just so you can see why this is a really effective tool for fluency. And I'm going to go to uh, the earliest level. The other thing about this actually, um, is one, these are designed for adult learners. So the topics, as you'll see, are work, are safety, are family and parenting, are money, are health. So it's, it's all sort of topics that are relevant to adult learners, which is obviously important. But the other thing that I wanna point out is this was designed or created because they felt, and they were right, that there is just a lack of quality readings that are adult oriented at early reader levels. And so they created a site to help solve that problem. So I'm gonna click on one of the stories just so you see what is available within it. And I'm just gonna do something quick here. I'm gonna download this supplement so that it's available to me. Um, no, Cause that's gonna take some time. Um, but this is the reading and this is the layout of each of the readings. Now, again, remember I said during individual time, there's all these different levels. You could easily just find the level that is, is um, appropriate for a reader and then just tell them, you know, this is the site to go to and here are all the readings that you could work on um, at your level. So sort of free reading opportunities. But you'll see this is one of the earliest levels and the sentences are short, they're very structured. You'll see there's a line, um, a number of words at the line count here. So this is the number of words up through that line. And so this is to help focus on fluency if you wanna do timed readings with your learners. And you'll see there's a nifty little timer here that I can click start and then um, start reading. And then wherever I end up at that point in the passage is the number of words per minute that I'm reading. So it could be sort of something that you engage learners with in that manner, just so they can check on their words per minute. Um, but what I love about this tool, which in terms of fluency, so speed word per minutes is obviously one element of fluency, but it also deals with proper tone and intonation and enunciation. For his children. He cooks eggs for them. So what you'll see is there's three audio recordings here on the bottom left, and they are at decreasing um, lengths because as you heard during that one, if you could hear it, the first reading is focused on word decoding. So it's really word by word. It's not chunking text. It is modeling for the learner how to read each individual word. The second reading, gets more into chunking text. So instead of it being he makes breakfast for, it's he makes breakfast for his children. And so it's getting into that chunking, knowing when to make the appropriate pauses. And then the third recording is with full intonation, full enunciation, prosody, um, and speed. And so there's three different sort of levels in which this text is modeled. So it's an excellent tool for fluency. Um, that supplement that I downloaded, if you remember, I clicked on this and did a download, I wanted to um, show you as well. And so on Reading Skills for Today's Adults, there's downloadables of the pre-questions and post-questions and the story itself. So you don't need to necessarily have online access in order to use this. Um, but in terms of the supplement, I just want to show you, and I need to move my little zoom window out of the way here. Oops, didn't mean to get that big. 
So there's all these activities that revolve around this reading. So we have a vocabulary activity. These are all the vocabulary words that are in this particular reading. Then there's a closed paragraph activity that uses those vocabularies, uh, words, excuse me. Then there's a fill in the blank activity that uses the words. Then we get into a language activity. In this case, it's simple present tense, verb tense, and it's dealing with words and or context that relate to the reading. So being somewhere on time, which was part of the story um, in this case, and looking at this particular um, language skill in relation to that. Then there's a speaking activity that does focus on comprehension, where they're asked a question and then they need to answer the question verbally and it even provides little sentence stems uh, for them to start their response. Then there's a multiple choice assessment and then there's a writing activity with two different options and sentence frames again to help learners structure their writing. So it's a really comprehensive supplement that goes with each of these readings and in and of itself it's, it's practicing fluency, it's practicing vocabulary, it's practicing comprehension um, just with the online reading and then this supplement. So it's an excellent tool uh, that I really love the update that, that they did because that supplement was not part of the original. Another thing that I want you to think about when talking about fluency and it not just being speed is thinking about ways that we can incorporate digital skills with learners in thinking about fluency. So if learners have a smartphone, then they most likely have one of these two tools here on the left. Uh, there's a voice notes app, which is on Apple products, and it allows you to hit a record button and then talk into it and then stop and then play it back. Um, you also have the ability to text that or email that. Uh, the audio recorder is the app that's on most uh, Android devices and it works in a similar manner. So think about, you know, if learners don't have you in front of them right now to be able to read out loud, they could be using that tool to record themselves at least and then play back to hear themselves read. And if, you know, maybe not now because we want to, we don't want to overwhelm students with trying too many things in a virtual environment, but as something maybe for the future, they could use voice notes and, and use other tools that, that you're using for communication to actually share their recording um, of their reading with you. So you're developing some digital literacy skills as well. Some other tools that you might want to think about are speech to text tools like Google Translate or Otter. So um, one of the things that Google has done really well is their ability to recognize um, spoken text and to use that, I didn't mean to advance here, uh, and translate it into actually print text. So I'm going to actually turn on closed captioning in this slide presentation so you can see how speech to text works. So in Google Slides, I have the ability to set closed captioning which means that as I am talking, the words are going to appear on the screen as you see them right now. This is great for obviously accessibility purposes for folks who are watching this. However, it's also a great tool for thinking about things such as enunciation. And I know that it does not like to, actually it did a good job picking up that word. But when we're thinking about fluency and what goes into fluency, namely proper intonation, if a learner is using speech to text tools like Google Translate or in, even in Google Docs, there is voice typing, which I'm going to show you in a second, then they can be practicing fluency and just speech in general because the words are not going to translate correctly unless I am using proper intonation, right? So kind of an interesting tech tool to be using for doing that. So I'm gonna escape out of here and just hop into the Wakelet for a second. Uh, within Fluency, um, I've got information about some of these tools, but I also created a sort of sample activity that you might use, and if you're using Google Classroom, which many of you are, you could copy this doc over and, and use this for any sort of speech activity. So I used Joe's Workday, which was the reading that I just showed in Reading Skills for Today's Adults. And reminder, 
Uh, I didn't say this when I was showing it, but Reading Skills for Today's Adults is an openly licensed resource. It has Creative Commons licensing. And so what I was able to do is to uh, pull sentences from that passage in here. And what you'll see at the bottom is that I have indicated that I got these sentences from the Reading Skills for Today's Adults passage. But you might have students read that whole passage, here's a link to the actual story, and then ask them to use voice typing to read a few sentences within it and practice their fluency. So uh, up here, I've given directions on how to actually activate voice typing in Google Docs, which is a great digital skill. And then I've put in some sentences here for them to use voice typing to read what is here and, and use voice typing to actually type it in here. And the way I use voice typing is I go to tools and I just click on voice typing. And then all I do is click on click to speak and it's going to do voice to text typing. He makes breakfast for his children. He cooks eggs for them. So this would be, and I should have stopped it, sorry. Um, so this would be a tool where you could provide sentences or even paragraphs for them to read. And then if, they, if you teach them how to use voice typing, they can use that and see if what is typed actually matches what they've read. Now an added thing that they'd have to do here because Google's translation tools don't punctuate um, is it's not going to punctuate for them. So they could either look and mimic it or you could teach them to use proofing tools in Google. So right here, it's going to give me this option as a suggestion. So this is suggesting I combine the sentences um, or I could hit enter here and then change this to a capital letter. So now you're teaching some typing skills along with some reading practice and some digital literacy skill. I see some questions in the chat, thank you. Um, all right, so I'm going to close that. And so this doc uh, is in the Wakelet. I almost deleted everything, didn't mean to do that. So you have the ability to make a copy of this and then just change the directions up here for whatever you want them to read and or just maybe just put sentence stems in here and that's it. Doesn't have to be necessarily from a reading, but students can be practicing speaking and um, again, using some interesting digital skills at the same time. So now we're gonna get into vocabulary. Uh, and the two tools, I'm not gonna actually dive into their websites, but there's two resources in particular that provide pretty comprehensive tier two vocabulary curriculum for you to use with students. And just as a reminder, Tier two words are words that are often referred to as academic vocabulary. And there's an academic word list um, that is used. So these, again, are words that the meanings of the words are not immediately apparent to learners. So Appalachian State University's curriculum, and again, this was an adult ed program that just decided to create this. Um, they've created 38 lessons that have five words a piece in them. So that's a total of 190 academic or tier two words. And each of the lessons, they're all downloadable Word documents, which means you have the ability to download them and adjust them as you see fit. You could remove activities, you could add your own activities. Um, so they're flexible because they're available as downloads. But the lesson structure is that each lesson starts with a sort of um, knowledge rating scale of the five words from the lesson, ranging from I've never heard this word before to I know the meaning of this word uh, or of some level of familiarity. And then they, they have a words in context activity, then they have a fill in the blanks activity, then they have a sentence completion activity, which as you'll see from these examples here, it's not just fill in the blank, they, in order to actually have a, a sensible response, they have to have an understanding of the meaning of the word that is underlined in uh, each of these sentences, and these are the five vocabulary words. Then they also have this nice little yes, no, why activity where it uses two of the words from the vocabulary list together and they have to answer yes, no, or why. Again, this helping to demonstrate that they truly know the meaning of the word as opposed to they're just matching or filling in the blanks. Now we approached, Crowded Learning approached uh, Appalachian State University to ask them if it would be okay if we could create Quizlet decks that go along with them, and they said absolutely. And so now, and this is in your Wakelet, 
along with this curriculum, we have 38 quizlets as well as one big quizlet that has all 190 words in it of each of the words from each of these lessons. And so students can access that for more interactive practice with the words as opposed to just working in the Word document where there's flashcards, there's matching activities, there's different things. Quizlet is very mobile friendly. It's very accessibility friendly. It has all of the audio um, for each of the words and the definitions. So it's just a nice sort of added tool to allow students to immerse themselves in the words more. Uh, I actually added this from a response to the Padlet from Tuesday's session. Uh, there's an organization here in Illinois called the Adult Learning Resource Center. They have also created a tier two academic vocabulary curriculum. Their lessons have 10 words per unit. And you'll see that these are all of the different types of activities that they have for each of these word sets. So Appalachian State University's lessons are five. Um, ALRC's sets are, uh, there's 10 words per lesson, but just great free tools that allow you to provide tier two vocabulary practice. And just one thing to note also about ALRC's curriculum, all of these are also downloadable Word documents, which means you have the ability to adjust them to add in additional activities as you see fit. Uh, another just uh, thing to talk about when looking at tier two vocabulary is this tool called the Web uh, Vocab Profiler. Now, it is not the prettiest tool. This looks like sort of circa Web 2000, uh, where people seem to like neon color text on black backgrounds. Uh, but it's a really cool tool because what it allows you to do is paste in any text that you want so it could be some sort of reading or maybe an article that you found that you want learners to read. You can copy that text and paste it into this space and then it's going to um, provide you with a list of all of the tier two words that are in that passage. So one of the things about evidence-based reading instruction, again, is explicit instruction um, and direct instruction around each of these components. So if you have a reading for students, you wanna be thinking about what are the vocabulary words that students should be focusing on. This profiler allows you to paste text into this space here, and then you'll see these are all of the academic uh, vocabulary words. So this is pulling from the academic word list, which if you, if you really wanna geek out on vocabulary, there are 10 sublists within the academic word list. Um, of the, the various academic uh, tier two vocabulary. Um, this is just extracting it from, from the passage that you paste in. So a really nice tool if you wanna be bringing in more authentic readings, but you wanna provide additional um, vocabulary practice. So the last component that we're gonna look at is vocabulary, excuse me, um, is comprehension. And obviously, as we've said before, uh, this is the big focus of, of instruction, is uh, making sure that students actually understand what they read. So the three tools that we're going to look at today are Common Lit, ReadWorks, and Read Theory. I'm going to show you specific features within each of these tools, but just know that they are features that actually exist in, um, in most of these tools. So things like audio uh, is available in most of these tools. But I also want to point out one thing that is in the Wakelet is when we did that Lynx professional development event uh, back in the fall, when we talked about comprehension, the two weeks that we talked about comprehension, we created a shared document for teachers who use these tools to provide their input on uh, both the features of the tool itself in terms of the content as well as the technical considerations. So this is linked both in this slideshow and in your Wakelet, but the things that are in this document are from adult educators. So adult educators commenting on the levels of the text and the engagement and relevance. So are they, are they good readings for adults? Is there, are they representative of culture and diversity? Do they have an, a nice sort of variety? Um, what do they offer in terms of feedback and reporting to students and to instruction, instructors, excuse me, but then also what are the technical considerations of each of these three comprehension tools? 
uh, how, how intensive are they in terms of students needing digital skills? Are they mobile friendly and navigable? Do they have accessibility features? So um, this is available to you to sort of just get and see input from teachers who might be using these tools. Uh, again, if you're, if you're here right now and you are using Read Theory Common Lit or ReadWorks, please feel free to use the Padlet and, and sort of comment on um, whether or not you like it, how you use it, anything. Uh, but just to sort of um, upfront, as we're thinking about comprehension, how the standards define comprehension, the standards have, again, five levels or grade level equivalencies, but they have three main sort of domains or anchors. Key idea and details, which you're all sort of probably familiar with. Craft and structure looks at sort of um, how, did, how is the writing actually organized, the things like compare and contrast or cause and effect, um, what is sort of the structure of the text and, and why is that being used in order to convey whatever the message is that the writer is trying to convey. And then the last sort of domain is, is a range of three anchor standards that focuses on integration of knowledge and ideas. And this is looking at um, if I've looked at multiple texts, what are the common themes that I'm seeing? What are the differences between them? What is the author's point of view in each of them? And how does that impact the information that they shared within the reading? Um, and all of these anchors span across all five of the college and career readiness levels, as well as the TAVE levels. So again, key idea and details, this is understanding like what is the main concept here, summarizing that, and what are the details that the author uses to support it? And so if we're looking at one of the three anchor standards in key idea and details, here are the five levels. And what you'll see is that they get increasingly uh, sort of more complex as you move from earlier levels to higher levels. But key idea and details is a domain that is across all five of these levels. Same thing with craft and structure. Again, this is looking at point of view and purpose. Craft and structure is also where we look at word choice and vocabulary. Why did the author use this word? Um, do those words, are, are they intended to sort of bias the reader in any sort of way? Um, again, what's the structure of the text and what's their point of view? And then integration of knowledge and ideas, again, is looking at different themes and formats of presenting information and how can a reader pull those things together to, to develop their own point of view around a concept that they read about or have greater understanding of it. Um, so the reason I bring these up is these three areas, if you're using TABE, for example, uh, a student's score report is going to be organized by their ability or, or lack of proficiency in each of these areas. So it's important to understand what they are but it's also important because the tools that we're about to look at, a couple of them actually provide reporting aligned to each of these areas. So it allows you to sort of evaluate students' proficiency levels in the areas that they're going to be tested on and in the areas that are defined by the standards. Once again, with comprehension, it's really important that we are putting students in levels of text that are appropriate based on the level that they are at. So the first tool that we'll look at is ReadWorks. And ReadWorks is a very comprehensive library of texts. Uh, included within that, there's 276 sets of paired texts. So remember that the integration of knowledge and ideas is looking at um, having a student actually read multiple texts around a concept. Uh, ReadWorks has a number of those available so that students can do that. Uh, it allows you to filter by level and uh, by lexile level and by grade level and or in, in various other filters. But a nice thing that's unique of these uh, three to ReadWorks is there are over 300 texts similar to Newzella, if you're familiar with Newzella, that allow you to uh, select the text and then see it in, in various different lexile levels. Um, so there's a range of them that can actually be adjusted. So on the teacher side of things in ReadWorks, this is what it looks like. At the top, uh, you'll see in this case, this is one of those readings that does have the ability to adjust the lexile level. Um, and you'll see that there if it is available for that particular reading. And then here is where you see the college and career readiness alignments. Now you'll see it's CCSS. 
The anchor standards, that's the common core state standards. These anchor standards are the same in the common core as they are in the college and career readiness standards. So it's a one-to-one -one sort of carryover. Um, so these, the R1, R2, R10 are exactly the same in both of those sets and of standards. And then in this case, this is a passage that does have related or paired texts as well. You will see here that there is a, um, a audio player that allows for reading of the passage. I will just uh, forewarn you, they are updating this for all of their passages, but when ReadWorks first came out, as far as I know, it was automated sort of artificial reading from computerized um, readings. It was pretty bad. Um, but they are going through the process of actually updating that so it is authentic human reading of the passages, so it's getting better. Um, but I just want to sort of make that note to you. Common Lit is very similar to ReadWorks in terms of its structure. I feel personally it has a number of tools that are far more beneficial for us as adult educators. Um, I also just think the concepts within and the topics that are covered are more relevant to adult education students, but there's 1,500 leveled texts. So again, it's a leveled library of readings. Um, all of these readings are downloadable and printable, as is the case with ReadWorks as well. What I like about Common Lit is they have a really cool guided reading mode that infuses uh, sort of diagnostic formative checks of the learner as they're reading. So it's not just read from start to finish and then answer questions. There's like sort of icons within the reading that, that prompt them to answer a question about you know, what they've read up to that point. And that's really helpful because remember one of the things that we talk about with um, evidence-based reading instruction is modeling of, of reading strategies, right? And so the questions that are embedded as guided reading questions are intended for the student to look back into what they've just read and make sense of it. Not just wait till the end to see if they understood everything they've read, but it's sort of guiding them and thinking about what did I just read? What are the implications of what I just read as they're reading as opposed to just at the end? The other nice thing about Common Lit is um, most if not all at this point of their readings are available in Spanish. So as I said, um, I like Common Lit because of its, uh, its, its relatability and relevance to adult learners, but similar to uh, ReadWorks, you have the ability to filter all of the readings by genre, by literary device, by text sets, so they also have a number of text sets, and what's nice about those is those dive into like content areas, social studies and science in particular, and then themes. And as you look at the themes that are showing up in here, these aren't just childish themes, things like morality and power and greed and prejudice and discrimination. Um, so getting into sort of topics that are, are relevant to us in, in a real world and to adults. Crowded Learning has provided alignment documents for Common Lit because of um, the way that they've organized their content and allowed us to do so. So we've provided a tool that allows you to find the student's uh, CCRS or TABE level here and then click whether or not you want to be focusing on key idea and details or craft and structure or integration of knowledge and ideas. When you click on any of these links, it's going to launch you into Common Lit with pre sort of established filters as to the anchor standards. So key idea and details is one, two, and three as well as the Lexile range. And so you're going to see all of the readings within Common Lit that are at the appropriate Lexile level um, and whose focus is key idea and details. So it's not, it's not sort of this like does everything for you, but at least it sort of directs you to the specific readings within the Common Lit library that are appropriate based on the area that you wanna focus on and appropriate based on the Lexile range for the students at various levels. So that's available to you. Um, as I said, all of these uh, readings in Common Lit are downloadable, so you can download both the uh, passage, the questions, and the writing activity as a PDF and share those with students. And we know that's important, not just uh, in, in classroom time, you know, but right now we're, we, you know, we're realizing a number of students may have, may have high limitations, if not no access to 
um, online resources. And so we, we, we have heard of a number of organizations creating print packets for students. So this would be a great tool for providing passages um, for students. This is what the interface looks like in reading mode for the student. It's got great accessibility tools for font size. They can click on um, read aloud so that they can hear it being read aloud. Uh, but you'll also see that there's guiding questions that they answer as they are reading. There's an assessment at the end that for each question, it's tagged to a particular anchor standard. And you'll also see that for the teacher, there are discussion questions available. So again, when we're thinking about a sequence of learning, particularly in our virtual mode, you could assign a common lit reading for your class ahead of Zoom time. And then you have available to you discussion questions that you could use to guide a discussion during your face-to-face -face virtual time. Um, so just something to think about in terms of an instructional sequence. Uh, they also have paired texts. Here is a sample of one of them related to uh, the, the addictive element of cell phones. So three different articles uh, focused on that. And one of the things that I like for teachers in Common Lit as well is they have these really helpful videos for sort of all of the different things that you might use that provide guidance for you in terms of how you might use these paired texts with your learners or how you might use those discussion questions with learners. So I really like that feature. I also like the reporting in Common Lit. So Common Lit provides both reporting at the student level on the guided questions uh, that you can download to a CSV or Excel file as well. So these are those questions that they answer as they're reading, but then they also have a report related to the uh, assessment at the end of the reading. And what you'll see is again, it's that same reporting as to whether or not they got it right or wrong, as well as up top here, the percentage of students that got each of these answers correct. But you will also see in this case, that it's giving an indication of which of the anchor standards was the focus of that question. So in this case, from this reading, because it's reading anchors one, uh, two, one, and three, the predominant focus of this passage was key idea and details. And so this is giving you sort of insights in terms of how your learners are doing on the anchor standards that are part of key idea and details. You'll also see that there's a writing activity that the teacher can actually um, be uh, responding to and grading within Common Lit if you choose to use um, the writing activity. The last tool that we're gonna look at today is Read Theory. Um, and I, I, I guess I'm saving the best for last. I like Read Theory because this is a personalized reading tool. And in the past couple of weeks, we have heard of organizations who in the absence of being able to test their learners right now, are using read theory as a diagnostic because they are getting people who want to start up in adult education because they suddenly are unemployed and they know that they're going to need education. And so since they can't tape students, they're actually using read theory as the tool for basically a locator test to identify the student's reading level. Uh, and this is because read theory is designed to be an individualized personalized reading program for students. And so the way that it works, and I always just point this out as well, um, what I like about Read Theory is it's very mobile friendly, as you can see here. If you can get students into Read Theory, uh, all they need to do is uh, do what you can do on any phone, which is add the URL. It's, it's a browser-based tool, it's not an app, but you could actually have them um, add it to their home screen, which is something available on any phone, on any URL when you're using your web browser on your phone. And then Read Theory will be added to their uh, home screen on their phone, and there'll be an icon just like any type of app that they can launch at any time. So the way Read Theory works is students take a diagnostic test at the start. And the first passage that they get within this diagnostic text, uh, excuse me, test is going to be at a grade three uh, readability level or a 580 lexile, or it might be a different lexile level, but it's definitely grade three. And then students answer a variety of questions on a number of different passages. It's a short test. Um, but basically what you'll see here, this progression is that first one that I answered, I got right. So now my next passage, is at a grade four level and a slightly higher lexile level. I'll answer that question 
and then my next passage is at a higher level, and then my next passage is at a higher level. Now, this sequence is because obviously I was getting those questions correctly. So it sort of adapts whatever the passage is that is next for the student based on how they answered the previous question. And when all is said and done, they are placed at the level that's appropriate for them. So this is a reading at a grade six level, which is where I tested into in my sort of um, mock sort of walkthrough of the pretest. So this was a passage that I had. Um, at level uh, grade six or 850 Lexi level. There's six questions for every passage once students are actually um, placed within the platform and they can do as many readings as they want at any time. So they answer questions at the end of each passage and they get immediate feedback as they're doing so with explicit explanation as to why their answer is correct or incorrect. Now this is a passage that I did and I intentionally got the first two wrong just so that I could see what reporting looked like for the student after getting some questions wrong. One of the things that I like about read theory, and this is also in those other two tools just before we show you the reporting, is you know those questions where it asks students to, uh, in the second sentence of paragraph four, the author says this. Uh, that's great and it's having them dive specifically into something being referenced in the question, but sometimes that's challenging and particularly in a test take taking situation, excuse me, that, that's kind of a waste of time. It's not reflective of the student's understanding to read um, if it takes them a long time to find that. But all of these tools have this nifty little uh, highlight text feature. It's different in read theory and common lit where if something specific is being referenced in the question where they're, they're saying, look at this sentence, you can click on it and it's going to highlight the specific thing that it's asking learners to look at. So I really like that because it, you know, it's, it's just sort of supporting the student in a way that you can with a digital tool um, and directing them to exactly what the question is actually asking them about. So I finished that, that passage that I showed you, I got two wrong. So I ended up getting four out of six right. So I did not pass uh, this one. But I did earn knowledge points, and that's a nice thing about read theories and the student reporting, they get knowledge points. So it's kind of a game-based sort of environment for students. Uh, so I can click on my progress as a student. You as a teacher can create student accounts and classes and have them all sort of in one place. But what I'll see from my reporting here is I started off here, so this was the first passage that I read. Um, I did well, and so that second passage where you saw I got two wrong, this is the level that that was at in terms of grade level. Then I got those two questions wrong, so it brought me down here to a, a lower level based on my performance. The similar sort of report is available for my Lexile progression. So I started off here, and the dotted line is just indicative of where I started within the platform, so I can monitor myself against where I started to see if I'm improving. Uh, second passage was a little higher. Again, then I got those two questions wrong and I got bumped down to a lower level here. But what's really cool about the reporting here is on my personal sort of report here, I'm seeing my mastery of concepts against the three major domains of the college and career readiness standards. Now remember, this says common core standards, those are the K-12 standards, but these domains and the anchor standards within are exactly the same. So those two questions that I got wrong, arbitrarily in this case, happened to both be around the domain of key idea in details. And so this report is giving me real-time view that key idea in details is an area that I might need to focus on in terms of instruction and practice um, because the other two areas I, I seem to be doing fine in, but this is one where I was getting some things wrong. So we've looked at a bunch of different leveled libraries, right, that you could be pointing students to and having them work on in their free time. Think about how you can use tools like graphic organizers. If, if again, we're thinking you only have limited time with students right now, um, maybe two, three hours at most, uh, in real-time instruction, if you're going to be having them doing free reading, some of that reading might be assigned, but you have these leveled libraries where they, they could be reading anything at any time. If you wanna work on a concept such as compare and contrast or cause and effect or main idea and details, 
how can you use graphic organizers and make those available to students to you know, promote learner-driven comprehension practice on their own time? And they're mapping out what the main idea of the passages and the core details that the, the writer is using. Uh, or even to integrate digital skills. I'm not gonna hop into the Wakelet again for time's sake, but in the Wakelet, I provided a main idea and detailed graphic organizer using Google Slides. So that Google slide, you could copy that over into your classroom and then give a reading assignment, add that Google slide into that reading assignment, and then have them map it out using the Google slide to show their understanding of main idea and details. Or you could do that with any other type of graphic organizer that you might want to use, uh, which might be the focus of a particular reading. Couple other resources for free reading that I just want to point out, because I think free reading is really important. Procon.org is a great site that has the pros and the cons around a number of different sort of controversial issues that are very modern and very relevant in today's world. Uh, this is one uh, that I just pointed out on should any vaccines be required for children, which would be a great thing to share out right now, right? When we think about sort of the issues that are very present in our lives right now, uh, this walks through the pro and the con arguments. Um, for each of these topics. There's videos, there's passages, there's timelines of history of the, the, the issue itself. Um, and then the student can be using that to gather evidence, evidence-based reading, uh, to form their own opinion around that particular topic. This is also really good if you have GED level students when they have to be doing evidence-based writing because typically they're looking at two passages around a topic and then extracting the evidence that each author provides to give their own argument. Breaking News English is one that I've heard about a number of times in the past few weeks because we've been looking for more and more ESL resources, but this is very similar to Newzella. Um, it's free and it has all of these lessons. This is from Tuesday, so these are the news articles, but you'll see that each of these news articles is available at different levels. So if you're working with ESL populations, that might be one that you like. Another uh, ESL resource, and again, all of these are in the Wakelet, is We Speak New York City. Um, these are episodic videos that are really highly produced. It, they actually, the way it is in the site, it's almost like a Netflix season, like season three coming soon. So each of these is seasons, and they're focusing on immigrant stories in New York City. Um, things like making new friends um, or helping people and uh, they have actually a couple on the census, and this I think is season two, which might be of interest. But each of these uh, videos has a study guide that goes with it, has a short story that pairs with it. They have uh, sort of um, story frames of the video, so where it's the student can watch the video, but then there's a PDF that has sort of frames from the story, and there are conversations that are happening in each as well as a script. So if you wanted to do reader's theater with your students, they could use the script for that. So really great resources for, um, for practicing reading from um, We Speak New York City. So just some final parting thoughts, because I know we're sort of at time here, is uh, you know we've looked at a bunch of different resources that can be used for each of these components. And now it's really, you know, think about which ones you like and want to explore more, but then also think about how would you be using that with students? Would you be creating assignments in something like Google Classroom or any other learning management system? Uh, or do you just want to use like a, a Wakelet or a, even a Padlet to put links to those things and just say, here, here are great websites for you to go to practice reading. Um, or do you want to use tools like Remind or WhatsApp or Facebook if you've created a private Facebook group to share out, hey, read this article before class. Um, if you want to sort of do that sort of asynchronous to synchronous sort of dynamic where I'm going to send out a passage that students are expected to read before class and then when we get to class, we're going to have a discussion that revolves around it. Um, I use Wakelet for actually creating lessons. And so um, if you click on any of these, and these are also available in the Wakelet, I will click on one of them right now, just so you can see. Uh, instead of using Wakelet as I have for this session, where it is just a listing of resources for you to be able to explore after, I've created a lesson. And again, this is using that reading skills for today's adults. 
um, program that we showed earlier for fluency. So what I've done for these stories, and actually all 10 of these, we had teachers work together to create each of these wakelets. And in doing so, they created a Quizlet that practices the vocabulary from that session. Um, so if you remember, I downloaded that supplement for meeting skills for today's adults. So teachers took the five to 10 words that are in that, um, that are in the supplement and created a Quizlet using those words. Then there's a link to the passage. And then we use the comprehension questions at the end of the supplement to create a Google Forms quiz where the student can actually answer the questions online. And then at the end, they get a report that says how they did. So uh, it allows for independent reading practice. It's providing comprehension, fluency, vocabulary practice, all sort of in one wakelet. And I see a question that's popped up in the chat. Students do not need an account on Wakelet um, uh, to, to use it. Uh, teachers don't, I even think, need to either if you just want to explore Wakelets and use them. Um, if you want to create wake Wakelets, you obviously need one. But no, students do not need an account um, to actually view the Wakelet that you've created. They might want one if they're going to, if you're going to have them actually accessing Wakelets regularly, because then it would be sort of bookmarked um, in their own account. But again, it's free. Um, the other thing that you, there is an ice cream shop going by my house, that's really interesting, I, I didn't know that was happening right now, um, is using tools like these, which is in that teacher tool page that's on the Crowded Learning website for quizzing students. Um, again, we talked about Zoom has polling, which is great, uh, but it doesn't give you any sort of reporting. Many of these tools do, obviously, Google Forms integrates into Classroom, but things like quizzes and cahoots, you can create quizzes and classes within it so that any of the quizzes that you give, you actually get student reporting on those. And that's just more if you, if you wanna be using other readings from other sites. Um, just so you know, uh, because we've been doing so many sessions and lots of teachers are spending valuable time, and I thank you for being here, um, learning, learning about these new tools. We now are issuing certificates for attendees of these sessions, so be on the lookout for this. Um, you will get this in the next couple of days. And then just as you leave here today, um, you know, I want you to think about, we looked at a number of different resources, right? Some of them are designed for you to be using in real time with your learners. Some of them are things that students can be doing on their own time. But think about, you know, you're not going to use all of them right now all at once, but if there's ones that you like and you think you might want to sort of introduce to students over the next few weeks, where do they fit into this sequence? And, you know, how can you be thinking about designing your instruction so that students have room and opportunity for personalized and individual work on their own time, and then that you're, you're assigning that and making that available to students in a way and providing them with guidance so that they're coming to you during Zoom time and even when we get back into the classroom um, with having done something that you can then talk about um, and, and, and be sort of, you know, providing real facilitated instruction around something as opposed to using your Zoom time to introducing something. Um, and then them having to go off and sort of play with it and then not getting that sort of feedback that you could provide in Zoom. So that's uh, it for today. Uh, I do have a quizzes. I'm, I'm, we're at time, so I, I'm not going to spend time on that. Thank you very much for your time. Um, I will stay for a few minutes now if you have any questions that you want to ask about any of the resources or the tools. Uh, or just uh, follow up. So again, for a follow up, you'll get the wakelet again in an email, you'll get your certificate in a separate email. Um, but the email with the wakelet will have the video recording of this session along with all of the tools that we walked through um, together. So that is on its way. So again, I will, if you have chats, uh, please feel free to put them in, questions, excuse me, please, please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, I'm not speaking very fluently right now after 90 minutes of doing so. So it looks like there aren't any questions. So thanks for your Thursday morning and uh, enjoy the rest of your week. Take care.